So all of the content will be made available on YouTube following, um, following the completion of today's webinar. So if there's any content on here you don't catch or you want to uh, go over again later, um, everything that you see here today will, of course, be made available on the YouTube channel. So to start off with, uh, my name is Alan Leslie. I will be uh, your host for this afternoon. Uh, I was previously with Extension uh, as a county ag agent down in Southern Maryland, and I'm currently the center director for Western Maryland, Central Maryland, and the Lower Eastern Shore Research and Education Centers. Today's topic is going to be on tools and tips for creating farm maps. So it's not necessarily going to be a full on tutorial. Um, so we don't really have enough time here today to, to go into depth on um, and do a full tutorial on any given mapping programs. But what I'm going to do is kind of give a broad overview of mapping tools and resources that are available. And I'll give kind of a brief introduction to one particular uh, map software program at the end. So first I need to hide floating meeting controls. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so as an overview of the content that I'm going to cover today, First, I'm going to go over kind of the usefulness of maps, why you'd want to use maps as a part of your farming operation from a few different uh, levels. We're going to explore some different mapping resources available. So we're going to look at some uh, online maps that you can access to get different kinds of information that would be relevant to your farm. Um, and we're going to look at, <clears throat> again, a brief tutorial, a brief introduction on how to use uh, QGIS, which is mapping software, for delineating fields. And we're going to talk about some more advanced uses for that software and some other uh, applications that you might be able to use that kind of software for, uh, for your own farm operation. So first, so uh, one of the really most useful uses of maps, one of the first um, ways you might want to use maps in your farming operations is simply far finding farmland. So if you don't currently have your own farm, if you're looking to get into farming, or if you're looking to expand your operation and pick up additional land, maps can be exceptionally useful for locating and deciding whether or not a parcel uh, would be a good fit for your farming operations. So there are um, a variety of different kinds of data that you would look for in these kinds of maps. So property records, property boundaries would be an obvious place to start. Uh, zoning or land use would be another important um, piece of information to know about any, any given piece of property. Neighbors, how many neighbors you have, what the neighbors are up to, what the neighbor's land use is zoned for. Uh, any historical land use. So if the land is not currently being used for farming, if it's been used uh, in agriculture in the past. And of course, soil properties, because uh, you're gonna have to have good soil quality to be able to support any kind of, any kind of agriculture. So, um, seem to have missed, there we go, sorry, skipped over one slide. Um, so one good resource, especially for Maryland, for finding information about different pieces of property, if you're looking for uh, new farmland, is Maryland's Environmental Resources and Land Information Network, or Merlin for short. So it's a <clears throat> website that's run by DNR, uh, it includes, among other things, information like property boundaries for different parcels, information on zoning, uh, some information about special conservation regulations, depending on where that piece of property is, uh, some rudimentary information about the soils, and some information about the historical land use. So we're going to go ahead and click on this link. It's going to take us to the website. So again, it's hosted by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. It's this interactive map. So you go to the page, and you'll click on this map interface here. It takes you to uh, a web application of basically a GIS uh, mapping type software. It also will give you a couple of pop-up screens that you have to get rid of to be able to see that map. So first that one, we're gonna accept all of our cookies, delete this. So here we have the state of Maryland. Um, so of course the, the map extent is gonna be in this pane on the right. 
and the left here are what we call layers. So these layers just represent different types of data that you can overlay on the map and that you can, you can visualize. So since with extension, I was in Southern Maryland and Charles County, let's go ahead and zoom in on Charles County and uh, take a look at um, this area over here between Port Tobacco and Nanjimoy. This is kind of an area where I've actually gotten a lot of calls from people who want to get into farming or looking for farmland in this area. So right now, the only layer that's selected is the state boundary mask. So it really just highlights the entire state, doesn't give us anything else in particular. Uh, but one of the first things you might want to click on is right here, the parcel boundaries. So once you click on that layer, it shows you all the lines that delineate individual properties. So you can see there's these smaller subdivisions here, these long skinny properties over here, big tract of land right here. And if we click on any one of these, we'll get some information about it. So let's click on this one right here. So it brings up this window. <clears throat> it gives us the identifying information and then a link for more, more information about that particular uh, parcel of land. So if you click on that link, it takes you to Maryland State Department of Assessments and Taxation, where they have all of the information about that particular piece of property. So here you can see things like uh, the principal use. So this is zoned agricultural, um, zoned for agricultural use. Principal residence, no, there is no, um, there's no house on this piece of property. You can see the size. So you've got 96 acres. Uh, in this piece of property, you can see the, the address, some other information about it, the history of changing hands, the, the assessed value of the property, a lot of the basic information that you would, would need if you were looking to buy that piece of property. So uh, this is a good place to start <clears throat> when you're searching uh, for property in different areas. And of course, you know, looking at the individual parcels is a good place to start as well. Uh, but on top of that, there's some other information that you that might also be useful if you're deciding between different pieces of property, uh, specifically for agriculture. So if we scroll down here, we can see there's other pieces of information like election boundaries, tax map, shoreline, watersheds, shellfish. Uh, but what might be <clears throat> particularly useful is this one here, where uh, you can click and it'll highlight mapped wetlands. So wetlands, looking at wetland extent is important because for the most part, you can't farm in wetlands unless you've got agri uh, special artificial drainage. Um, and that in itself usually requires additional permits and additional uh, payments. So if you've got this lovely large tract of land with a big old wetland running through the middle of it, that might not work as well as one that uh, does not have wetland um, mapped in the middle of it. Another piece you might want to look at are what are called critical areas. So in Maryland, especially, there are these uh, designated buffer areas around a lot of the major tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay called critical areas. You can farm within the critical areas, but you just have to be aware that there are additional restrictions when it comes to certain types of land use. So um, there's additional restrictions with respect to putting up buildings, uh, they, they really just want to make sure that whatever land use that you're, you're implementing in that area is not having any kind of negative impacts on those watersheds. So it's just something to be aware of when you're looking to pick up new pieces of property. And again, I mentioned that there's also some rudimentary soils information. So if we click on this tab here, um, soils data layer, you can see it uh, brings up all these orange squiggles. <laughs> so this is the soils map and you can scroll in. Again, if you're considering looking at any individual parcel of property, uh, you can click on any of these map units and it will give you basic information about that map soil unit. And it doesn't give you a ton of information, but what it does give you is farmland class. So this one here that we just clicked on is not prime farmland. So this one, map unit GMF, uh, tends to be really gravelly, really sandy, not very productive soil. Uh, so again, this is kind of a coarse look at different properties, but it gives you a quick and, and dirty way of comparing different parcels for their potential as, as farmland. All right, let's return to this PowerPoint. 
<clears throat> so if you are looking for even more detailed soil information, um, there's a separate mapping service for that called USDA's Web Soil Survey. So the Web Soil Survey contains so much information and is such a, such a powerful database that we really could cover an entire uh, seminar just on using Web Soil Survey. There may have actually been a seminar on this in the past. Today, we're just going to briefly look at the website and look at how to access some of this information in a more detailed way. So the information contained here includes things like expected texture of the soil, drainage class, the slope of the land, um, and some specific information about suitability classes for particular uh, soil map units. So if we click on this website, it takes us to the home page uh, for Web Soil Survey. Usually to get to it, I just end up Googling Web Soil Survey. You click on this big green button right here and it takes you to, again, another mapping interface where we've got the map here on the right and then all of our tools over here on the left. Um, the only difference between this one or the main difference between this one and the previous map is that the extent of, of this one is nationwide. The other one was only for the state of Maryland. So using these tools up here at the top, we're gonna to use this magnifying glass to zoom in to Maryland. And again, we're gonna look down here in Southern Maryland just because that's the area that I'm most familiar with. We'll zoom in a little, a little bit closer. And here we have, uh, zoom in even closer than that. Here we have this beautiful forested piece of land. So first of all, I would never recommend that anybody buy a completely forested land for agriculture just because of the expense of, of having to clear it. <laughs> um, but we're gonna look at this piece anyway. So the next step after you zoom into whatever area that you're interested in is you create what's called an area of interest. So there's two different tools here. This one creates just a rectangle and the other one allows you to create a polygon so you can accurately uh, trace over property boundaries if you know the extent of property boundaries. We are just going to look at a rectangle. So when you create that area of interest, essentially what that does is for this rectangle, it accesses the soils database and collects all of the soil data information for that area that you highlighted. You can view it in a few different ways. So you can click here on soil map and it shows you Kind of those same orange squiggly lines that we saw in the Merlin program, only here they're all labeled. So you see BA, B here, BCA, GMF. On the table here on the left, it gives you descriptions of each of those and their relative percent in your entire area of interest. So we can see this BAB, Beltsville Silt Loan, makes up about 37% of our entire area of interest. It's the most dominant soil type in this rectangle and it's really the most dominant soil type um, across a lot of, of farms in southern Maryland. What you can do is you can click on these descriptions here, the map unit name, and it brings up uh, this window here where it's got a whole lot more detail about that map unit than what we saw in that, that previous Merlin map. So this will give you uh, kind of general description of the area that you tend to find this type of soil map unit. Uh, it'll give you the landscape setting, gives you the typical profile. So if you were to put a shovel into the ground, this is what you would expect to see. Silt loam down to about 20 inches, and then you see BTX. This is what's called a fragipan, a very dense impermeable layer that impedes drainage, uh, and then a few other layers below that. One thing that's of interest is up here, the farmland classification, all areas are prime farmland. So that area, that information is right here up front uh, and easily accessible if you're using this tool to determine whether a piece of property is, is good potential farmland. You can also look <clears throat> at this other tab up here, the Soil Data Explorer. Now this is what makes the soil survey, web soil survey a little bit difficult to navigate is that the information is, is hidden across all of these different tabs. So once you get the hang, handle of, of switching among these different tabs to get different pieces of information, uh, the program becomes a little bit easier to use. But once we click on Soil Data Explorer here, we see there's a whole other set of tabs uh, that we have access to. 
we're going to look at the suitabilities and limitations for use. And over here on this table, if you scroll down, we're going to look at vegetative productivity. And we scroll all the way down. It gives us expected yields for irrigated crops and yields for non-irrigated crops. Um, we're going to look at expected yields of non-irrigated crops. We're just going to choose corn, you know, kind of just for reference, and click on view rating. So what this does is it takes these uh, map units that we have in our area of interest. It accesses the huge database that they have on soil properties, and it gives us a rating for each one of those map units. In this case, the rating is your expected yield of corn in bushels if you were to grow uh, dry land field corn in a, an average year. So we see that Beltsville silt loam would give us about 77 bushels per acre on average which depending on what part of the state you're from may sound terrible, <laughs> but down in Southern Maryland, we don't tend to have the highest productivity soils. So we do see some soils that, soil map units that have uh, higher expected yields. So this Woodstown Sandy Loam, 125, but we only have a single acre in our area of interest that's mapped to that, um, that soil map unit. Some do really poorly, so 52 here, that gross town mar hog hole complex. Some are going to be blank. So this one is that gross town mar hog hole complex. This is that really sandy, really gravelly soil, um, but it's also a very, very steep slope. So th these that don't have a rating at all are just not suitable for farmland. And we see that there's a significant portion of our, our mapped area that's mapped to that uh, map unit. So this might actually not be a very good place for us to, to purchase for farmland, even if it was cleared. Um, and again, you don't necessarily have to be growing corn, especially not dry land corn, but this is a very useful tool just to, to rank different map units um, for their potential productivity for agriculture. All right, we're gonna close out of that, return to our PowerPoint. <clears throat> so if you already have, farmland, you're not searching necessarily searching for new farmland, uh, maps are, are still going to be very useful for a lot of other reasons. Um, one of the main ones is maintaining farm records. So they can help with accounting, especially with accounting for things like crop insurance or cost share. Um, calculating your inputs, you don't know how much you're putting down per unit area. If you don't know the extent of the area you're putting it down on, calculating yields accurately, uh, and tracking field use through time. So keeping track of um, your cropping history and, and doing it in a way that's field specific. Uh, so there are a couple of different agencies that will just produce maps uh, for you, for your farm. So FSA or Farm Service Agency will produce farm maps for you if you're enrolled in any of their uh, cost share programs or their crop insurance programs. Uh, it's just their way of accounting for the acreage of land that you have enrolled in those programs, you know, the amount of acreage that's enrolled in, in CRP or CREP programs uh, or in, in crop insurance. If you have private crop insurance, chances are, oops, um, that crop insurance agency will also produce maps of your farm because they want a good account of how much acreage of farmland you have if they're going to be uh, ensuring your crop yields. They have to have an accurate measurement of your, um, your actual yields per, per unit area. The nutrient management program will also produce maps of your field. So the quality of the maps that you get from the nutrient management program is going to vary somewhat depending on the particular nutrient management advisor you, you, you're working with, uh, but they're all going to produce basically rudimentary maps of each of your fields for the uh, express purpose of tracking nutrient inputs across your farm. Uh, so <clears throat> these maps are particularly useful because they're already linked to certain data. So they're linked to the soil tests that you take uh, every three years. They're linked to specific nutrient recommendations. And if you're tracking your nutrient inputs in the same way, you can superimpose those directly onto these records and keep accurate records of what goes into each field. Uh, and cropping history. So these are all pieces of data that go into your plan uh, on an annual basis. 
And you can use this as a tool for, for tracking your, your fields on an annual basis, adding in your yields for each of the fields, uh, any inputs in terms of irrigation, uh, other inputs like pest management, insecticide, herbicide, fungicide uses, uh, all as a way of tracking the, the entire enterprise on a field scale basis. Uh, this is just an example of some of the records you'll see in your nutrient management plan. Uh, neat organized tables just gives you a good platform to just add your additional data on top of that and keep track of it on uh, a field by field basis. But, you know, farm service agency, <clears throat> um, you know, crop insurance and even the, the nutrient management program, they're only going to map your fields and, and create maps to the extent that they need for their particular programs. You may have additional needs where you might want to map your fields on an even finer scale. You may want to create maps that add additional information beyond just the field uh, size and location. And so for that, you're going to have to use your own type of mapping software. So uh, there are three that <coughs> are, are most widely available or widely used. The first is Google Earth. Google Earth is one that's probably the most approachable and simplest to use if you've never done any mapping before. It works essentially uh, very similar to uh, Google Maps. The only difference is you download this as a desktop program. So anything that you do in the Google Earth software, you can save as a file uh, to your desktop and go back to it. So you can create fields, outline fields, measure things, measure areas, measure distances. It's a very useful program. It's free to download and it's very simple to use. ArcGIS is kind of the industry standard for mapping software, much more flexible than Google Earth. Uh, this is a you know, professional level software program. Uh, if you've ever used it before, it's got a pretty steep learning curve, um, much less approachable than Google Earth, and it's very expensive. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend this uh, unless you're planning on doing this for a living. But QGIS is another uh, map software program that has almost all of the functionality of ArcGIS, but it's free and it's an open source software program. So QGIS is the one that we're gonna work with and I'm gonna show you all uh, how to create kind of simple um, plots of fields uh, today. The idea that it's got all of, the, all of the features of Google Earth, it's gonna take a little bit more of a steep, steeper learning curve, but it gives you much more flexibility in terms of what you can do for mapping. So, What's useful about these, all these different uh, mapping software packages is that you can import what are called additional data layers. So all of the different maps that we've looked at so far, all of the data that are contained in those maps are available online to download. So you can download property boundaries, you can download the mapped wetland extents, you can download streams uh, and conservation buffers and include them in your own personalized map. These are all things that aren't necessarily gonna show up in that farm service agency map or that crop insurance map that you have. You can create even more field subdivisions. So in that nutrient management plan map, it's only mapped to the extent of your management units. But if you've got different crops on kind of a subfield basis and you wanna keep track of that from year to year in your maps, you can do that using these software packages. You can measure and plan for changes. If you want to subdivide fields, if you want to rearrange your field layout, you want to estimate what that size and look at what that layout would look like in the future, you can do that with these programs and kind of play around with your field layout, um, especially if you're planning to do something like put up fencing or put in new roads. You can directly measure how long they're going to be and, and what the cost will, will, would expect to be. Uh, and keep digital records. So all of these will help you link all of your, your crop inputs and crop yields directly to the map so you can have it all in one location. Again, some of the downsides, there is a learning curve, even with the simple Google Earth. Um, most of it's point and click across all of these different programs. Uh, but, but again, especially if you're using ArcGIS or QGIS, there's so many different options that there is a learning curve. Uh, processing power. So we're going to see today that my computer is probably going to lag a little bit because especially these two programs take a whole lot of processing power. Uh, the good news is modern computers are just getting more and more powerful. So as long as you've got a computer that's less than, I don't know, five years old, 
then you should have no problem running any of these programs, even on a basic laptop. And then internet connection. So uh, this, this one is most important if you're using Google Earth because it doesn't save all of the maps to your hard drive. It will access them kind of through the cloud so you're not downloading huge files. If you're using these other programs, you are gonna have to download very large map files for even basic mapping. And these individual files might be in excess of a gigabyte or more. So you either have to have a really fast internet connection or pretty good patience to use these programs. So as I mentioned, we're gonna go through not really a full-blown tutorial, but kind of an introduction to QGIS. There are tons and tons of, of, of tutorials available on YouTube. What, what we're doing here is really just selling the idea of using maps as a tool for your farm. Uh, if you really want in-depth information about how to actually use these programs, um, I would just search through YouTube for, for individual tutorials. Today, we're just gonna have an overview and introduction of the program and how it can be used in your, your application. But QGIS is free, it's open source. So you just go to this website <clears throat> and you would download the program direct to your computer. Uh, again, it doesn't cost anything. They come up with updates on a regular basis. There's a whole community of people who uh, to work to, to put out this, this program and to keep it uh, up to date. But I already have it downloaded on my computer. So we're just gonna access it here. After you download it and open it, this is what it looks like. So we're gonna start what's called a new empty project. And when you start a new empty project, it really is empty. It's a complete blank slate. So there's nothing there at all. It doesn't even look like a map. The first thing you have to do whenever you are uh, creating maps with a program like QGIS is to download and, and bring in uh, the base maps. In this case, we're gonna use um, aerial photography. So to do that, we have to go to another website. Um, so there are a lot, again, I mentioned there's, there's a lot of different spatial data available for free to download. Most of it is available through US government websites, either USDA or USGS. Um, we're gonna look at the USGS Earth Explorer website for one place where you can download uh, aerial imagery for your farms. Some of the other uh, databases where you can get information, um, the USDA soil survey, all of that information that was on the soil, web soil survey, you can download um, from their website. Again, these are huge files to download, so make sure you've got a good internet connection. Uh, topographic maps, so if you wanna look specifically at uh, slope and aspect of, of uh, pieces of property, or you can download that from the US Geological Survey. Uh, streets, if you want, <clears throat> if you want maps of, of, of actual streets <laughs> to go along with, you know, outlining your, your piece of property, um, OpenStreetMap is a resource for downloading um, map streets, but also, you know, state websites and county websites will often have a lot of this information. Uh, the state highways, the county, county roads, um, will usually be available on, on their respective state and county websites. So let's click on this USGS Earth Explorer just as one example of how, how you would interact with one of these websites to download the spatial data. So again, this should look fairly similar. A lot of these uh, mapping or map tool websites kind of look the same. You know, your, your interface here um, for search criteria on the left and then the map over here on the right. Um, so this one, you can actually search by either putting in information here on the left um, or zooming to a particular area on the map. And so for us, I'm going to zoom uh, back into uh, Southern Maryland here. We're going to look down here at this area. I first actually came up with the idea of developing um, a webinar on mapping. While I was working with an uh, organic farmer down in Southern Maryland. And this is his operation right here. So he owns about an 80 acre farm, a diversified organic farm, nestled right between two of the largest grain farmers in, in Charles County. Uh, but you can see that he's got a lot of fields. He grows a lot of different crops. He's got a lot of different things to keep track of. And he is constantly rearranging field size, uh, merging fields, splitting fields, changing the shape and the layout um, to best suit his operation. So um, that's where I first came up with the idea of using 
or developing a, a webinar to show how to use these tools to, to accomplish that. So this is what we want for our base map, basically this aerial image of the farm. Um, what we have to do is first tell this website which data set we want. And the data set we want is under here. You can see all these different types of data that you can get, declassified data, commercial satellite data, Landsat, land cover. We want aerial imagery. And we specifically want this one down here, NAIP. That's the National Agricultural Imagery Program. So basically every two years or so, uh, USDA will take satellite images and compile them to create these, air, these um, databases of aerial imagery solely for the purpose of, of keeping track of the extent of agricultural land in the United States. So uh, this, is, this tends to be the most up-to-date and the most useful and relevant uh, imagery for, for mapping farms. And then we go back up here to the top under search criteria, and then we're just going to click on use map. So you see this area becomes highlighted in red. So it's going to search the database for imagery and the NAIP database uh, that corresponds to this highlighted area on the map here. And we can look at our results. <clears throat> and here it gives us a list of different files. And one of the most important things to look at here is uh, the date. So this is the most recent one. The imagery was acquired in 2021. If we scroll down, we can see we could get records all the way back to 2005. So some of the imagery databases are a lot older. This one only goes back about uh, 20 years. So we see here, though, that there's two from 2021. We click on this little foot. It shows you the footprint. So this purple area is that image file and everything that's included in that image file. And unfortunately, if we look at this red image or this red square, which is the area we highlighted, this purple square only covers half of the farm. So if we want to cover the entire farm, we actually have to download two files. So this green square covers the other half. You see there's some overlap between the two. Um, that's just how they make sure to to not miss any land, all of the image files are gonna overlap slightly with each other uh, to make sure the entire extent is mapped. Uh, but if we want the entire farm, we have to download both. I won't do the download process because again, these are huge files. I think each of these was over half a gigabyte. Um, but the one thing you have to re uh, realize is that if you wanna download this, it's free to download, but you have to create uh, an account. You have to create a login and be logged in to, to download this, these data. So let's go back now to our QGIS program. Once you download that base map, that image file, uh, it's just a matter of adding it to your, um, your project. So you'd go up here to layer and then add layer. And we're gonna add what's called a raster layer. So there are different types of data. A raster data set is essentially an image. When specifically for these spatial data, uh, it's an image where each pixel represents a particular piece of information. So again, we have two different maps that we have to upload here. So here's the first one, we'll click add. And then we'll add the second one. And here we have in our mapping program, uh, that mapped extent we can zoom in and find our organic farm. There it is. <clears throat> Another useful thing to do down here on the toolbar is rotation. So we're gonna highlight that. We're gonna rotate it about 20 degrees. So this doesn't really do anything except uh, fits the farm a little bit nicer into our, our field of view. So now it's lined up uh, kind of perfectly horizontal with our, our window. It's not at an angle, so it'll be a little bit easier to see. Um, the other thing we're going to do before we start manipulating anything in the program is to go up to the project, go to properties, and we're going to change some of the original settings. So uh, you can, again, measure distances, you can measure area. We're going to, we're going to do that in this, in this introduction. Uh, but because we're in America, we're going to change it to feet. And because we're dealing with farms, we're going to change the 
a, a unit of measure of area to acres. Um, otherwise, if it gives us a unit of area in square meters, we just don't, don't really know what to do with that information. So we'll click OK. That'll update uh, our map. Um, and then the next thing to do is to start actually outlining the fields and, and um, delineating where our field boundaries are. So we're going to start up here in this kind of area. So again, if we were just looking at a nutrient management map, this entire area would probably all be highlighted and called field one. But obviously, we can see here that there's a lot more going on in this field than just would be captured by labeling the entire thing field one. We've got all of these different rows. This particular farmer grows all kinds of heritage grains, all kinds of exotic fruits and vegetables that no one else is growing in the entire state. So it would make sense for this guy to, to keep careful records of everything he's growing in each of the fields. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to create what's called a shape file. So over here on all these buttons, these little um, buttons with the, the little asterisks next to it uh, creates new layers. So we're going to create a new shape file layer. This essentially creates a new file, a whole new file that stores all of the, the spatial data that we're going to create. Uh, we're going to call it, well, we're going to save it in this folder. And we're going to call it field one. <clears throat> the geometry type, we're going to create polygons. So this layer is going to be a set of what are called polygons because we're going to basically have um, rectangles or other shapes delineating the fields. And we just hit OK. So it brings up this uh, warning message here. So it talks about um, a conversion for the coordinate reference systems. So this is something that you're going to have to deal with if you work with either QGIS or ArcGIS is making sure that all of your layers, all of the information that you have in your mapping project uh, is essentially speaking the same language. So we're just going to click OK on this. Um, and then I'm going to go back to this PowerPoint and show you what we mean by coordinate reference system. So the reason we have to deal with coordinate reference systems and the reason why multiple different maps don't always talk to each other correctly uh, is because the Earth is round and we're trying to represent a sphere in two-dimensional space. So to do that, there's different ways that you can take that round sphere and project it onto a flat surface. So if you can kind of imagine these spheres of the Earth and the Earth is transparent and you have a light source inside, uh, these projections are essentially like, like shining the light through that transparent Earth onto these different flat shapes, unfolding them and using that as, as your, your two-dimensional map. Uh, so you can do this with a kind of a cylinder where the equator is much less distorted than the poles. You can do that with this kind of cone shape where the higher latitudes are less distorted than uh, mid latitudes, or with these kinds of radial disks uh, where the poles are much less distorted than the rest of the, the map. None of them is perfect. Each of them does a better job representing different parts of the Earth. Um, and depending on where you're downloading your spatial data from, they could be using any number of, of transformations to accomplish this. So as an example, <clears throat> there are a handful of different standard um, coordinate reference systems for mapping the United States. Here are four of them displayed on the screen here. And you can see uh, how they're all distorting the United States in different ways. And so if you downloaded one uh, spatial data layer with this transformation and another with this transformation and try to put them both in the same two-dimensional space, obviously they're not going to line up. So that's the reason why we had that warning. It's just saying that it's using a mathematical conversion to get our two maps to, to, to talk to each other. All right, let's return to our QGIS program. So now that we're in the correct coordinate reference system, we can start actually drawing um, the field boundaries. So we're going to zoom in here. And it really is 
as simple as tracing the outlines of these fields. There's a tool. Um, <clears throat> so we use this tool here to create our uh, new shape file. And now we're going to create uh, a new polygon. So we click on this polygon tool here. Again, any of these with the yellow asterisk creates a new um, creates a new object. Yes, very good. And so to create our new object, all we're going to do is with this little kind of crosshairs tool here, click on the corners. And it may be kind of hard to see, but it starts to draw this little red line. And then as we add a third um, corner, it starts to draw our highlighted area. Once we click fourth, we've basically highlighted this entire field. And then we can right click and that creates um, our, new, our new polygon here. So here we've created an outline of that field. Um, it's relatively simple because the field is already basically rectangular in shape. We can zoom out. Uh, but what if our field is not completely rectangular in shape? So we can look at this field, for example. For some reason, this corner of the field was cut out. It might've been too wet, might've been too weedy. Um, a rectangle is not going to be a good approximation of this field, but you can add as many of these points as you like. So for these straighter areas, it might only take a few clicks. Once we get to the curved areas, we just start adding more and more of these clicks, creating what are called vertices that more or less approximate the curvature of this field. And then again, when we're finished, we just right click. And now we have this highlighted area um, showing our, our field here. And so once we've created some of these fields, and zoom out. Um, Obviously, I'm not going to highlight every single one of these, but once we've highlighted all of these fields, they should all appear <clears throat> in a separate file where we can keep track of them separately through what's called an attribute table. So in QGIS and in these GIS uh, software programs, you can upload as much data as you want and associate it with each of these particular polygons, each of these particular fields that you highlight uh, in the program. You can also upload data so if you have uh, coordinates or if you have um, GPS data, uh, especially this is especially useful if you don't have up-to-date uh, aerial imagery. So in this particular case, in this farm, the farmer excluded a part of this field, cut out a corner of it just because it was too wet. So it was getting flooded occasionally from this little creek back here, but he wanted to know the, the current area of the remainder of the field. So to do that, we just had a simple handheld GPS device, walk the perimeter of the field, and then you can upload those data points uh, to the program and, and calculate the area, measure the area of the field using those data. Um, for the sake of time, we're running up close to the end. We're not gonna upload those data here today, but just wanted to show that, uh, that that's another use. You know, If you don't have current aerial photography, um, another use for this program um, for uh, looking at <clears throat> the size of, of different field layouts. So I do want to show you the attribute table for um, for our shape lay our shape file here. Here it's blank, but essentially the attribute table for each of your shape files is just an Excel spreadsheet. So once you start creating fields, 
if you have yield data, if you've got cropping history, if you've got anything else associated with individual fields, you can upload it to this program and save all of that information all together uh, in a single file. And so it's just a, a simpler way of kind of databasing all of your, your, your field history information um, and tying it specifically to your individual fields. So this is, again, there's a lot of other things that we can do with this program, but this is just meant to show you kind of broadly how the program works, how to download it, how to open it, how to bring in some files, and to show you that it is very simple. It's a very simple process to um, draw these different field borders to create, create your field maps and then tie that to uh, the field history data, the yield data, the input data that you might have uh, for your farm. Let's return to our PowerPoint real quick. So as far as other applications for these uh, field maps, again, we said you can plan and measure alternative layouts. So you can either do that freehand in the program or you can do it um, with a handheld GPS device and, and tracking where you would lay out fields and overlaying those GPS coordinates onto the, the program. Um, you might measure different irrigation layouts. So using the program, uh, you can draw lines and measure the extent of those lines. You can connect multiple lines and measure the extent of a network to figure out either how much irrigation you need or which layouts will be most efficient and use the least amount of materials. You know, on top of marking your fields, the extent of your fields, uh, you can also indicate where other objects are. So irrigation risers, locations of wells, tile drains, utilities, other things that are going to be underground, but things that you're going to want to keep track of uh, on a long-term basis, um, you can put those into the maps. Travel distance. So, you know, especially for um, <clears throat> produce farms, for cut flower operations where, you know, time is essential. Everything's done by hand. If you want to limit the amount of time spent traveling to and from fields or handling um, products, um, you can measure the distance that you're traveling to get to fields to, to harvest produce and return to the packing shed and, and configure other layouts to maybe streamline that, that process. And again, store uh, and view yield and crop data. So one thing I didn't show you because we don't have yield data in there um, is that you can change the appearance of those different fields based on any criteria. So you can visualize your high yielding fields, your low yielding fields, um, your high pest pressure fields, your low pest pressure fields, as long as you have those data uh, in the program. So it's just another way of, of visualizing, of looking at uh, data you're already collecting. And then <clears throat> again, the example that I gave is really for uh, geared towards the smaller diversified operations. Of course, I was working with an organic farmer to develop uh, this, this kind of webinar and curriculum. Um, but maps, maps are especially important for larger scale operations too. You've got a lot more acres to keep track of, a lot more data, potential data to keep track of. Um, but one of the things we've seen, especially over the past several years, is a, a streamlining of data collection um, from built-in units on tractors, on combines. Uh, and proprietary software to handle that data. So for better or worse, usually it's a lot easier to, to handle. It's a lot uh, simpler to navigate. You don't have to create your own maps. It's all prepackaged. Um, but everything I showed you today is, is free. <laughs> so that's the trade-off there. It's a, a wonderful system. It's something that more large-scale grain operations are going to have access to is this data storage and data visualization. Uh, but of course, it will come at a price. And so with that, we're coming up on the end um, of today's webinar. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us here today. And I'm going to check the chat and see what kind of questions we've got. So let's see. It says, was there pasture suitability in there too? I assume you're talking about um, the uh, web soil survey. Uh, there is. So um, Web Soil Survey covers uh, land use suitability classes for all kinds of things. So for agriculture, it's under a range of different crops. 
Um, we only looked at corn as an example, but they have they have pasture and range suitability in there as well. Um, they've got suitability for for building um, different types of structures. Uh, so it, it, there's a there's a massive information in there on, on land suitability. Um, this question asks, so it automatically pieces the two maps together. Um, I'm not sure what that was in reference to. If it was in reference to the uh, soil map or the, um, the the two base maps that you downloaded because they needed oh, to overlap. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It it overlaps those two area extents, and then it just you just see it as one seamless layer. So if we return to that and toggled one on or off, you would see where they overlap. But um, especially since we're zooming in uh, to a small extent of those two files, uh, it just looks like one, one image. Next is, if I remember correctly, all the maps have corresponding coordinates. And so the overlays are always accurate. Uh, they do have corresponding coordinates, but in this two-dimensional rendering in the program, it's using a specific coordinate reference system. And so, like I showed in the slide where we had the four pictures of the United States, all of those have the same coordinates, but each of those pictures is, is distorted. So the program needs to take those coordinates in that file uh, and kind of recalculate that distortion to make it appear um, the, in the correct shape in the mapping software. So that's that's why we got that warning. And, and typically you click OK and everything just works just fine. Um, attribute table. So the attribute table depends on how you set it up. Um, you can have the shape file be field one and put all of your subfields as, um, as entries in that shape file. And that's probably the, the simplest way to do it, especially if you know field one has, if you're doing your soil sampling for field one altogether, and then you're you're cropping multiple different crops by by subfield or or subplot within that. Um, that that's typically how you would arrange that attribute table. Utility databases from counties, electric, water, etc. There there should be. Um, I know that that they do have as, as actually on that Merlin map you can see um, municipal water hookups. So I believe. The counties will also have databases for um, at least the county run utilities. They might not have things like high speed internet, um, but they might. It, it depends. It depends on the counties. Some of them do a better job of compiling it and making it available to the public than others. Kentucky State, this is very clear to the point. Permission to pass this recording to farmers. Yes, it'll be, this recording will be um, uploaded to YouTube. So it's gonna be freely available to everyone. So um, it will be on the Mid-Atlantic uh, Women in Agriculture YouTube page, along with recordings from all of the past Wednesday webinars that, that we've done uh, over the years. So yes, you can please circulate as far and wide as, as, you, as you like. Biting my nails at the cost of ArcGIS. No idea this existed. Yes, QGIS is amazing. Um, it's amazing how powerful the, the software is considering it is completely free. Um, and there's a lot of support for it. So there, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of tutorials online. Um, there's a lot of kind of help files that people post. There's a, a whole community of users. So if you have, especially if you're just getting started, there's a lot of tools out there to, to help guide you through it. Recording of the webinar, yes. So it is being recorded. As I mentioned, it'll be available on YouTube. And I think that is all the questions. So uh, if there are no further questions, we are pretty close to the end of the hour. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. <laughs>